Thank you for tuning in to the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church of Memphis YouTube channel for another worship experience. The Lord has favored us again with life and an opportunity to worship him virtually. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that you will make your words simple enough for us to hear your voice as though you were speaking specifically to us individually and for our limited minds to understand and do whatever you instruct us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today we're looking at Romans chapter 7, verse 4 through 6 again, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version. It reads, Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law uh, through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit to God. I hope you haven't forgotten the title of this series that we're working from, Show Me Me. First in the series, uh, we started in the book of Isaiah and preached through the first six chapters, describing the reason for Isaiah's statement, woe is me. We looked at a period of Israel's life and we looked at their character, their conduct before God, and their depraved condition uh, as it pertains to their character from the view of a judge who would hear a court case against a defendant. In that court-like setting, the divine lawyer presented an airtight case against Israel. God made an offer that we would be quick to take if we were in their shoes, or would we? Since all have sinned and come short of God's glory, and it wasn't something that we chose, but it was what we chose after suffering. Now, it's like this. We are like Israel, and we... Uh, are not quick to accept of many of the wonderful offers of mercy from God in our lives today. We've, we've uh, finished off uh, Isaiah by looking at the prophet Isaiah's life, where he saw first the Lord high and lifted up. And then he saw himself uh, and he said, I'm undone. And he saw the people that he dwelled among. And they were undone, undone also. And he cried out, woe is me. And once he recognized uh, that, that even though uh, Uzziah, the king during that time, was dead and his throne was empty, yet God was still on his throne. And that he not only was on the throne, but he was able to do something about Isaiah's depraved condition. And once God uh, uh, took care of his filthiness, his wretchedness, then uh, he heard the voice of God saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? At that time, Isaiah declared, here am I, send me. And now we're in the seventh chapter of the book of Romans, and we're discovering why the apostle Paul cries out, oh, wretched man that I am. My assignment is to help us to understand better our relationship with the Lord now that we believers are out from under the law and under new management or ownership. I'm going to talk about the law, Jesus Christ, and redemption. The law, Jesus Christ, and redemption. That's the subject for today. The law was our old master until Jesus died in our place to pay the price for our sin debt owed to God. Now, just because we attend the gathering of the church members or believers uh, doesn't mean that our journey is finished, that we have, are, are, are completely free of the law. That won't happen until Jesus returns and changes us from what we are to what we shall be. And as long as we uh, consciously or unconsciously act as though our relationship, our right relationship with God depends on what we do, that's an indication that the old has not totally 
died or passed away yet. When we completely lose our dependency and our need for the law to do what it was not designed to do in the first place, that is to make us right with God, to justify us in God's sight, then we will be dead to the law and completely accept the works of Jesus Christ uh, to save us and to reconcile us to God. First John chapter three, verse two says, beloved, we are God's children now and what we will ha- what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself as he is pure. So we're talking about the law, Jesus Christ and redemption. The first position of the law is a wonderful truth. The law is dead to believers. The scripture says that believers are dead to the law and it works the same in reverse. The law is dead to believers and believers are dead to the law. Both are true and are saying the same thing. Believers are dead to the law. Therefore, the law is bound to be dead and inactive to believers. The law has no jurisdiction or power or rule or authority or dominion over the true believers. And the law is dead. Uh, It's a dead issue to believers and it has nothing to do with believers. The believer is dead to the law and the law is dead to the believer. The, The law simply does not exist to believers as it pertains to the need of it to make us right with God. Now, this is a shock to a lot of people, but it's exactly what the scripture is declaring. The believer is no longer under the law and its accusing finger and is no longer under its guilt and shame, its tension and pressure, its condemnation and punishment, its sense of failure and unworthiness, its discouragement and frustration, its sense of disappointment and defeat. Now, why is this so important? I'm glad you'd like to know. Think about how hard it is to break a habit that you've had for a long time. Maybe some of us have had an addiction to cigarettes, and I did say us, and tried and tried to quit, but found it basically impossible on our own. All believers have had an addiction to sin. Scripture says all have sinned and come short of God's glory. Now, sin is the transgression of the law. Simply put, sin is working or going against God. Now, we were reminded last week that the law had three purposes. The first purpose was to reveal the character of the eternal God to the nation of Israel and to set apart the nation of Israel as distinct from all other nations. And the third purpose was to reveal the sinfulness of man. And uh, I'm planning on working with those three individually in the weeks to come, hopefully. Uh, But it depends on the Holy Spirit and his guidance. Uh, Notice how the wonderful truth becomes real in our lives. The believer is dead to the law by the crucified body of Jesus Christ. The believer is slain or put to death in Christ. This is a faith action through baptism. We participate in baptism because we are showing on the outside an inward decision that we have made concerning Jesus Christ. The law has nothing to say about a dead man. The believer's death in Christ Jesus was a proxy death, a stand-in or a substitute. The believer does not actually die himself, but the but he participates in the death of Christ spiritually in our belief. Now, let me let me uh, make it clear. The proxy death. You, 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 th- there are situations in life where you give your proxy to someone else. You, you allow someone else to stand in and speak or act in your place. 
And that's what we were giving, the, uh, uh, participating in, uh, with in Jesus Christ. He was there on Calvary dying in our place, dying to pay the price for our sin debt. He stood in for us. He was our substitute. Now, when man believes in Christ and his death, God takes that man's belief and counts him as having died in Christ. And when I say man, I'm speaking for mankind, all of us. What I'm saying is God counts the death of Christ for the death of believers. God considers the believer have to, have to have been in Christ when he died. Galatians chapter three, verse six says, even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. That's the way uh, the death of Christ is accounted to us also so that we can be made right with God. Now, why does God do this? Because Christ died in man's behalf, in man's stead, taking the penalty and punishment of the law upon himself. Therefore, the believer being dead in Christ is freed from the law, from its demand, from its guilt and punishment. He gave up his place so that we could take his place and he took our place. There, there's a story that I ran across that basically uh, helps. Uh, it helped me a lot in this situation to really understand it, and I share it with you. And this, uh, it probably helped me a lot because I'm from the old school. I grew up on a plantation with my grandmother and my brother, um, and we were kind of we experienced some of these conditions. The story goes: when the government phased out its surplus commodity food program. One man went early to the last distribution to secure a place in line before the food stuff ran out. A few hours later, he was near the door when, when, where the cheese and butter and dry milk and peanut butter were, were handed out. It was then that he saw a friend walking by and called him by name. He knew the man. Neither his wife nor he had had any work for some time now, and they had four children to feed. The man confirmed that his prospects were poor. The man in line knew the food would run out soon, but he told the unemployed man that really needed and had children and a wife to feed. He, he, he told him to take his place in line. And the poor man did so, and the other man went to the end of the line. And with that, within a short period of time, the distribution ended, and the one who gave up his place had also given up his food. This is like Jesus Christ who drew us into his place while he stepped into ours, taking upon himself all the consequences of our failures. As it says in 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, for God made Christ who never sinned to be the sin offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. And that's the Living Bible translation. Christ redeemed believers from the law by being a curse. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law. In other words, everybody that don't obey the whole law are cursed. And God said in the Old Testament, he says, if you obey me, it will be as a blessing to you. If you disobey me, it will be as a curse. So Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. In Galatians 3, uh, third chapter, verse 10 and verse 13 says, uh, everyone that hangs on a tree is cursed. And we are saved from that curse by the blood of Jesus Christ in whom we have redemption through his blood. We have the 
the forgiveness of our sins according to the riches of his grace. But now in Christ Jesus, uh, ye who sometime were far off are made nigh or near to God by the blood of Christ Jesus, as Ephesians 2.13 says. And Ephesians 2 and 8 says, For by grace ye are saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, uh, having abolished in his flesh the hostility, even the law of commandments uh, contained in ordinances for to make in himself uh, of two one new man, not making peace or, or uh, uh, so making peace by the cross. And though he might, uh, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the, 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 the hostility or the enmity uh, by, by the body of his flesh. In the body of his flesh through death to present us holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. That's Colossians chapter 1, verse 22. Now, these are equivalent expressions. They teach the same truth. Christ bore our sin in his own body upon the tree. And that was prophesied in, uh, in, in, in the Old Testament and fulfilled in 1 Peter, well, on the cross. And it's stated again by Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. His suffering satisfies justice. His death makes us acceptable to God and believe and delivers us from the penalty of the law. And therefore the believer is free from the law. Who his own self bear our sins in his body on the tree that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness. In his stripes, we are healed. For Christ also had once suffered for sin, that uh, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the spirit. Now note the glorious purpose of the believer's death to the law. The believer dies to the law so that he can be united with Christ, the risen and living Satan. Note that the picture of marriage is used again. Before the coming of Christ, the believer was married and united to the law. He was under its rule and authority. But now since the coming of Christ and his death on Calvary, we are married the believer is married and united with Christ and we are under his rule and authority. Believers no longer live as the law says uh, 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 under the authority of the law, but we live as God indicated through the law based upon Jesus being able to fulfill the law through us. So it's about what Jesus did and not about what we did. Christ came to fulfill the law and therefore he and his commandments includes uh, not only the law, but uh, much more. But note that believers are married to Christ, the risen and living Lord. The marriage is not a dead or an inactive marriage and and, and I'm resisting saying more about that uh, uh, as far as marital relationships. And a lot of times, well, I guess I'm not, I'm not doing a good job at re uh, resisting. A lot of times we allow, as married couples, we allow our marriages to die. We become inactive in the marriage process and we allow our relationships to die. But Jesus does not allow the marriage to die. Paul says, wherefore, my brother, you are 
uh, you also become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. And, and, and I've been married, uh, my wife and I have been married for 47 years. It's so close to 48 years that you can, a, a strong wind would just blow us into 48 years. <laughs> That's my version and I'm sticking to it. But in order for us to bear fruit at this point even to God, I, I'm talking about uh, uh, fruit to to, to enjoy being with each other, to enjoy our relationship, to enjoy uh, uh, doing things together. It, it's important that we not allow our relation, and even in friendships, even in the fellowship, it's important that we do not allow the work that Jesus did on Calvary to bring us together to unite us, to reconcile us to God and to one another. It's important that we do not allow his work to die in us. Know ye not that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a heart? God forbid. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealous, for I have espoused or promised you to one husband that I may present you as a chest virgin to Christ. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 12, or verse 2, rather. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bone. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 30. Let that therefore abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning. This is Paul talking. If that which ye have heard from the beginning and shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son uh, and in the Father. Believers died to the law so that we can bring fruit of, uh, worthy to be presented to God. I beseech you, brother, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, let's see if I can summarize this sermon with the story of a relay race. The, 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 the main two runners in this relay race is Jesus and the law. The law takes off first with the baton in its hand. And we are represented as the baton. The law is pumping and running. He's off the block fast and he's running and running and running. And, 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 and now he nears Jesus. And ne Jesus puts forth his, puts his hand back to receive the baton. And, and, and the law has been struggling all the way from the garden up to seeing Jesus, trying to get us to Jesus. And now he pumps a little bit harder. And now he, he, he stretches out his hand with the baton in it and places the baton. He places us in Jesus' hand. And Jesus takes the baton. He takes us and he takes off. Jesus is the sprinter. He's the one that's going to win the race that the, that, that the law could not win. Now, the law is not dead to those that don't believe in Jesus. But to those that the law was able to present into Jesus' hand, the law goes back and tries to deal with them. But now we as believers are in Jesus' hand. And here he goes to the finish line. And like any race, it's a struggle. It's a difficult run. It's a, it's a, it's a race that is not easy. But Jesus is willing to run this race in our place. And he's nearing Calvary now. 
and he's getting weary, worn, and he feels all alone. But he holds on to the baton. Now they're nailing his hands to the cross. They're driving the rivet through his feet. And there he is on the cross. He feels that he has been deserted even by his heavenly father. And he cries out, Lama Sabathane, my God, why, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But he feels an eerie presence through all of the darkness. And he can hear a faint voice from, from on high saying, I have not forsaken you. But I've got to leave you there for a while. Because you've got the baton in your hand and you've got to finish the race. They won't be saved unless you finish the race, my son. So Jesus says, I thirst. And they gave him the, the, the vinegar or the sour wine or whatever it was. And, and then he, he hung his head in the locks of his shoulder. And for you and me, he died. He said, it is finished. Jesus has delivered us safely into a right relationship with God. That, that there, uh, I, I'm, I'm so glad because without the work of Jesus on the cross at Calvary, there would be no salvation. There would be no fruit that we could bear. We would never be justified or made right with God. I, I'm glad that he died to pay the price for our sin. They buried him in a borrowed tomb, but, but you know that's not where the story ends. Because early the third day morning, he rose with all power in his hand. Now the nail prints are still there, but they represent the freedom to overcome whatever is holding us, including the law, addictions, hatred, selfishness, abuse, oppression, poverty, you name it. We are now more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. The hole is still there in his side, but it assures us that he gave, as he gave up the ghost, he died, but it also represents power to overcome death and anything else that we have to go through. And he's now sitting at the right hand of the Father, making intercessions for us. And him there at the right hand of the father and not in the tomb represents eternal life. He's alive forevermore. Yes, he's the alpha and the omega. He's the beginning and the end. I got to quit now. That's it for today. So let us pray. Our heavenly father, we pray that though we've heard your word, but still, unless you give the increase, we will only have a desire to apply the lessons and not the ability to move from just hearing to becoming doers of your word. So now we acknowledge our need and we ask for your help. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Well, that's it. And uh, don't forget to uh, wear your mask. Practice social distancing, wash your hands often, and this too shall pass because we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. If you run across somebody that's losing hope in this time, we're responsible to bear fruit in their lives. Sow the seed of hope. Let them know that Jesus is able to save to the utmost. And the not matters how does not matter how low we might be in spirit. He's able to lift us up. And we'll be bearing fruit. So until next time, take care. I love you.